Jim is undertaking a five month sabbatical health care today. Vikram Raghavi is his host. Next COVID has sent for Jim to use his office. Jim will be here through May. Uh, please feel free to talk to him. Uh, Jim is a local boy. boy. He grew up in Hunting Huntington. Redondo Beach. Uh, Red Redondo Beach. Oh. <laughs> Uh, One out in Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> His passion for surfing is his choice for, for higher seats. He obtained, he obtained his degree with Santa Barbara, PhD from San Diego. All sides were discovered just as Jim entered this school. His thesis focused on study of microstructure in Paul Paul Sazards using the thousand foot uh, super radio details. This is a quite a quite development of then novel novel digital processing. Else, after a brief stint at UMass, Mr. Jim joined the the Stone Department from the next time at Cornell. Engineering professor this Bill had built a Cibo studies of ISP in the 60s. The giant Cibo reflector, substantial pressure front front and was refurbished to operate at high frequencies as high as three gigahertz. And an event system for planetary radar was installed by NASA. master. Jim, along with a clutch of students, made rapid progress in phenomena or interstellar and scintillation, Jim, ISS. Instead, instead, let me read his 1972 Cambridge thesis that established the wide, the wide presence of ISS. Even, even high clarity is Jim and his student, Joe Lazio, are, are famous developing E2000, which model for the electron distribution in a galaxy. And he's compulsory references to that in any FRB talk. When Steinbrink, Steinbrink and students discovered parabolic and pulsar data, Jim was ready with a theoretical model. Now we consider the classic paper. Jim was the first to draw attention that that hypothesized steady steady signal in the radio radio band would be limited by FFX to ISS. Okay, on a personal note, no, no, no. I first met Jim at the, at the observatory either in 80 or 81, which means I'm on Jim. friends. He's the sort of friend I like the most. I can debate vigorously with him, have fundamental disagreements, but at the end of the day, we can suspend hostilities at the bar and continue it the next day. For instance, I maintain that the study of pulsar emission mechanisms, which as you know is a big part of Jim's career, is, to put it kindly, a quagmire at best avoided. Jim is the foremost such expert and yet we are friends. <clears throat> it's, to, it's time to wrap up this introduction. Fortunately, Jim has moved away from fine structure studies of pulsars. Over the past decade, Jim has focused on nanograph and fast radio bursts. The latter is the topic of the talk today. The floor is yours, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Sheree. So, Jim, I'm gonna try to speak here one more time. Oh, okay, oh, I see it. The audience was complaining of a lot of echo as well, so I'm not sure what's going on with it. So go okay. ahead and start and we'll see if it okay, works. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction, Shri, which I, some points of which I'll have to rebut, but, but, um, and also the thanks everybody for the invitation to program and for the sabbatics. So it's great to hear uh, away, away from y'all uh, and from the winter, especially. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about um, a few aspects, some aspects of F of FR. And I, I know that you had a colloquium here, Jason Hessel's, uh, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and, and I think there's a lot of over, overlap. I'm going to say with. So, so, so Jim, I think yeah. uh, we're going to have to use your computer mic. So just try to stay near your. Okay. Computer. 
uh, but I need to enable that then. Right? No, it should be gone. Okay. Maybe somebody can verify that the online people can hear. Okay. Okay. So anyway, um, we're gonna have to speed up here. So I'll give a short background on FRBs. I want to uh, talk briefly about one puzzle about uh, FRBs and their periodicities. Then I want to talk about propagation effects and what we can do with them uh, in FRB world. And, uh, and one of the, you know, a lot of people think of the propagation effects scattering and so forth as deleterious, but as I say here, you can turn lemons into lemonade, and that's part of the, uh, the story here. And also what I'm going to talk about is basically, well, one of the things is redshift estimation uh, using uh, not just dispersion measures, but also scattering. I think that's going to be a promising um, avenue, but um, that has to be judged in the big, bigger picture of we're going into the era of large scale, that is many FRB localizations and redshifts. Uh, that said, not all FRBs will be localized and have redshifts. So I think the, the scattering approach is gonna be useful. Um, okay, let's see, my advancer doesn't seem to be working. And um, okay, there we go. Okay, so just some uh, a very quick summary of what I wanna talk about. Um, we know that these FRBs are at cosmological distances. They're incredibly bright compared to galactic pulsars, uh, 10 billion times brighter in some cases, and even a million times brighter than the giant pulses of the crab. Uh, they have complex time frequency structure, and I'm sure Jason talked about this. So on the, the right there is a, a classic time frequency plot with a drifting structure. I'm not gonna say uh, much about that. In another talk, I might have talked about um, plasma lensing as possibly playing a role in that, but that's not a topic for today. Uh, it might have something to do with the emission mechanism, but I'll leave that to Shri. <laughs> uh, okay, so then um, we know that some FRBs are associated with magnetar-like objects. Maybe that's true for all of them. Uh, uh, we don't know yet, uh, but that plays a, a role in some of the things that I'll discuss. Uh, there are persistent sources around a couple of the FRBs. These are synchrotron nebulae that are thought to be driven by flares from the magnetar. And in the case of FRB 121102, uh, that model indicates that the source is quite young, uh, perhaps less than 100 years old. So the, the things I want to really highlight are the periodicities or lack thereof. Uh, so for a couple of the repeaters, a few of the repeaters, <laughs> Uh, if you look on short time scales in some of these bursts that have copious numbers of bursts detected, in some cases you might have a hundred over a two hour period, you cannot find any periodicity uh, in those sequences. That's radically different from a pulsar where if you had a hundred pulses spread over that much time, you could, it would be duck soup to find the period. So something uh, strange is going on there. Um, on the other hand, there are long period periodicities, quasi-periodic, that I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, in one case, a 16-day period, the other case, 160-day period. All right, so just uh, to show a few of the time frequency plots, the original one, uh, top left, is the famous Lorimer burst. Uh, the one on the top right uh, there is the discovery plot uh, for the first repeating FRB. So that was an Arecibo discovery. You can hardly see the dispersion sweep there. Uh, and I have to, to say, I was a little bit skeptical when we published that, but once it, it repeated, then uh, things were good. Uh, then there are others like in the middle on the right there, showing the, uh, the splotchy structure and time frequency that is radically different from what we see from pulsars. And then lastly, the two on the bottom right show the asymmetric tails caused by multipath propagation. And that's an important feature for what I'm gonna talk about today. All right, so uh, one thing that um, FRBs and pulsar pulses have in common is a model, um, you might call it a signal model uh, that is basically uh, amplitude modulated shot noise. Uh, so this is different from a synchrotron source with incoherent radiation where there's no hope of seeing an individual particles radiation. But in the case of a coherent process, like we, no, we must have for these objects, uh, there is the notion of a coherent emitter. 
And so uh, the basic building block then is a shot pulse uh, with a, a time scale of, uh, let's say, a nanosecond or less. And then a sequence of those shot pulses is, is the envelope there that might be of order a millisecond. So we have a large number of these. And this model uh, clearly applies to the crab pulsar. So on the bottom right there is showing a single pulse spread over a few microseconds um, with 0.4 nanosecond resolution. And one of those shot pulses is three megajancies uh, and is unresolved. And so that's clearly an individual emitter of some kind, uh, you know, quite bright. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning this is it comes into play in one of the things that I'll be talking about, which has to do with um, looking at fine scale uh, structure in a burst from the FRB in the globular cluster of M81, and the fact that there does not seem to be any scattering whatsoever <coughs> along that line of sight, except from the Milky Way. Um, so in, in any way, part of that story relies on the shot pulse model. Okay, so uh, another uh, sort of uh, foundational thing I want to mention is the dispersion measure uh, redshift plot. Of, <laughs> so the big frame here is showing dispersion measure on the, on the horizontal axis and redshift uh, on the y-axis for 15 FRBs. And the DM uh, on the right here has been uh, the Milky Way component has been subtracted. This band here represents what you expect from just the intergalactic medium. And this comes in, this is essentially identical to what was in the uh, well known McQuart et al. Uh, 2019 paper about missing baryons, <laughs> uh, which was based on fewer uh, sets of objects. So, anyway, the, you know, there's clear, there is a trend. Um, uh, higher redshift means higher dispersion measure, but um, there's a lot of slop in that. Um, but then one of the other things I'll be talking about today in a little bit more detail is FRB 1905-20B, um, which is way off the curve here. It has a, uh, an extragalactic component here of about a thousand DM units. And so the, you know, the question is raised then, is this just an outlier that we should ignore in this whole business of looking at distances and you know, redshifts? in terms of DM, or is it going to be part of the, the variant story, uh, part of the cosmic variance? Personally, I think it's going to be the latter. But uh, anyway, so I'm going to just uh, breeze through uh, the periodicity story. This is based on um, a couple of papers that Ira Wasserman and I and Shami Chatterjee have written um, uh, about this, where we were looking at uh, precessional models, free precession models. Uh, other people have looked at those as well. Uh, but first of all, I just wanna show one example of a, an FRB, uh, 121102. So with a fast telescope in China, 1600 bursts were detected uh, over about a two month period. Um, on some days there were a hundred bursts. Periodogram analysis, uh, like uh, uh, in these two frames, uh, shows no astrophysical periodicity. Now you may be saying, well, yeah, but what about these spikes here? Well, those spikes simply have to do with a daily sampling. Um, you know, a couple hours of observing each day uh, with some adjacent days. And so uh, there are no periodicities in this data set, either long or short. Um, it was two months and this particular object has a 160 day uh, periodicity that was too long to identify in this data set. But the main point is there is zilch evidence for any kind of fast periodicity. Um, on the other hand, there are some papers, uh, recent papers that have uh, shown bursts that indicate uh, some kinds of at least quasi-periodic behavior. And in this case here, uh, the separation of the 10 bursts is something like 217 milliseconds. That would be a respectable spin period. Uh, if it were a spin period, and the other, the other two cases have smaller uh, separations of these bursts. Um, then there's uh, another thing uh, in a more recent paper that's on the archive. Uh, for this FRB, there's a single burst uh, detected with five subcomponents, and those subcomponents have a, a somewhat regular spacing of 0.415 milliseconds. That is far too small to be a spin period of a neutron star. 
Um, so, you know, is that, does that have anything to do with the spin of a neutron star? No, uh, but what is it? Uh, could it be some other kind of oscillation? Uh, to me, uh, this is reminiscent of the quasi-periodicities that we, has, we saw long ago in pulsar microstructure. There were low Q oscillations and had no relationship to spin. Um, but that begs the question of what are these things? And I'd say the jury is out. Um, but for now, I'm going to say for the three objects that have more than a thousand bursts detected, we don't, we can't identify a period. Um, so anyway, uh, here's an example of uh, the object with a 16-day period. Um, on in this panel, you see these gray bands that indicate the windows in which bursts can but need not occur. But when they occur, they occur in these windows. Uh, the duty cycle of these windows is about 30 to 40 percent. Um, and then the interesting thing is that if you look at different frequencies, um, the high frequency bursts occur earlier in one of these windows than the lower frequencies. That may not be too big of a surprise if you imagine um, a beam of radio emission that's being, let's say, precessed around in some fashion. Uh, radio beams of pulsars are frequency dependent, um, so maybe it's a similar kind of thing. And when we talk about beaming here, it's not relative. It is relativistically beamed, but the relativistic beams are very narrow compared to the what I call a macroscopic beam. It's the macroscopic beam that can be frequency dependent. Okay, so that's more information. So anyway, there's a set of ideas that have been floated over the last few years for uh, the nature of, of these long, uh, long period periodicities, various precession models, lens Turing, uh, free precession, geodetic precession, uh, accretion type scenarios. It's natural to think of an orbit uh, when you have those periods. Um, asteroids and such. Um, in the other category, the one that I think is very cute is that the periodicity, in fact, is the spin periodicity uh, with a 16-day spin period or a 160-day spin period, Benny Amini at all. Uh, I don't think it's very easy to get such long uh, periods, so I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, but I, I like the idea. But then there's the whole non-compact object type uh, type cases, cosmic strings that David Chernoff and others uh, uh, have discussed. Um, so anyway, the, the study that Ira, Ira Wasserman and I did um, was in the context of the millisecond, um, or at least uh, young Magatar type model, uh, like that of Metzger et al. Um, in their model and other by others, they have the burst coming from the nebula uh, depicted here in various colors for different um, regions or regimes here. Uh, the bursts originate here from synchrotron masers. Um, now, what we were looking at was uh, having the central engine, name, namely a, a spinning neutron star, uh, actually be where the, the bursts are, are produced. And I think that's more fitting when you start having a copious number of bursts, uh, whereas in the synchrotron maser model in a distributed region, you would have, I don't see why you would have a sparse set of bursts, for example. Um, and anyway, the other thing is that this model was motivated by the persistent radio source seen around FRB 121102. And there are other FRBs that do not have persistent sources. So you apparently don't have such a nebula, but nonetheless you have bursts. So anyway, uh, that's, the, that's the kind of context that we've been looking at. And so with a, a young magnetar that's uh, maybe uh, hypermagnetized, even for a magnetar, you have all kinds of activity. Um, so reconfiguration of the surface magnetic field. We know that takes place because I'll jump to the next slide and come back. Um, where is that? Here it is. Uh, so on the right here is showing average pulse shapes for the galactic center magnetar, uh, uh, several epochs spread over two years. Uh, these are averages of thousands of pulses each. And uh, with a pulsar, we would get a characteristic shape. Uh, and it would be rock steady, like this millisecond pulsar here, uh, where the, the pulse shape is steady over uh, more than a decade, uh, probably more like three decades. But here you see the average pulse shape is changing radically. So that says that the magnetic field of the neutron star is, is evolving. 
Um, that's for a, what I would call a um, sort of an old age magnetar. <laughs> Whereas what we're talking about here is a young magnetar. There's a little caveat on the millisecond pulsar here. Um, uh, there are a whole bunch, there are something like uh, over 50 profiles over plotted here, and most of them are indistinguishable, and that's because the shape is rock steady. Um, but there are some outliers here, and we established that those are from calibration errors. Um, but there is a caveat here uh, from recent observations of this millisecond pulsar, which is one of the key pulsars for nanograph and gravitational wave detection. That's a story in and of itself, and you can talk to me about it later. But, uh, but anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, the main point is that magnetars, ordinary magnetars, act differently from, than radio pulsars. And so I think a hypermagnetar is going to be even more dynamic. So we have magnetic reconfiguration that changes the figure of the star uh, 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 in the moment of inertia tensor. That will drive free precession. That will cause the beam to wobble. So we'll get pulse shape changes, intermittency when the beam uh, misses the line of sight during part of the precessional cycle. But another aspect of free precession uh, that has not been uh, fully appreciated is that you also induce torque fluctuations. Uh, and so that causes arrival time noise. And then on top of all this is you have phase jitter of some kind uh, that may come about from variable emission altitudes or possibly other propagation effects. So you put this all together and it's potentially a big mess, right? Uh, but it's, I, I put it differently, it's rich in phenomena. Um, so uh, in the context of our papers here, let's see, can I get rid of this bar here? Drag it, yeah, um, this down here. Okay, so in these two papers um, that are in press, the question is how do we, just, if we have a precessional model, and we're not saying that the precession model is the answer, but it's certainly something to be explored, and we explored the heck out of it. Um, but if you have that to explain the long period, uh, periodicity, how do you destroy the manifestations of the spin periodicity? Um, you know, so we, we want to do both of those things at the same time. So the ingredients then are free precession. We looked at um, uh, axisymmetric stars and triaxial stars uh, and the precession that comes about. Um, then sporadic coherent emission from whatever the emission process likes to do, and then phase jitter. Um, so what you need to do, and so there are various ways of erasing the fast periodicity. So just to cut the story a little short, um, I'm not going to say much about free precession. It's just something to give you a long period. And uh, it may as well be an orbit. But you can't get rid of the problem of hiding the fast periodicities unless you do something different than, than happens in pulsars. Um, but I will say that to get free precession in a neutron star, you, it's not just something you can advocate and leave it at that. Um, you have to turn off, or at least there can't exist uh, superfluidity in the neutron star where you have uh, superfluid vortices pinned to crustal nuclei. Uh, because that what those pinned vortices do is that they make the precession period be no more than about 10 to the four times the spin period, which is far too short, uh, we think, to account for the long periods. How do you not have superfluid uh, in a neutron star? Well, a very high temperature or a large uh, uh, stochastic B field inside the neutron star can get rid of the, can prevent superfluidity from taking place. So that's Ira's domain. He's the expert on that. Um, anyway, so the point here is it's non-trivial to, uh, to get free precession. Um, okay, and I talked about that already. Okay, so the other, another aspect of this that we looked at was spin noise, the torque fluctuations. What we know from pulsars is that um, for the canonical 10 to the 12 Gauss type neutron star, uh, there is usually quite a bit of spin noise, and this is due to torque variations uh, that come about from the magnetosphere. Um, some of the variations undoubtedly have something to do with, uh, you know, like glitches have something to do with the way the vortices interact with the crust in a noisy way. 
so here I'm showing timing residuals for uh, a few pulsars, uh, three pulsars here. So these are of order, well, in this case, four seconds worth of uh, spin noise. Uh, these processes are very red. So you tend to see variations that are of the same order as the length of the, you see quasi-sinusoidal variations of order of the length of the time series here. That's because a second order polynomial has been removed uh, for reasons that pulsar astronomers understand. So the crab pulsar shows of order one period's worth of spin noise over, uh, I think this is a, about 20 or 25 years. Uh, there's even a millisecond pulsar that shows 100 microseconds worth. And then a, a bunch of other uh, 10 to the 12 Gauss type pulsars show this timing noise. So we have a scaling law, um, which is here, you can't read, but the main point is we have a scaling law based on, on pulsars uh, that involves the, the spin period or the spin frequency and the spin frequency derivative. This is a highly read process, so it also depends on the length of the data set. So it goes like uh, capital T, that's the length of the data set squared. Um, so very red. And if you extrapolate that back, or extrapolate to a hypermagnetar, uh, you indeed get huge amounts of uh, spin noise, the RMS of 10 to the five seconds if, uh, over a 10 year period, uh, or even longer, even more at a 10 year period, even over a 10th of a year. So the question is, can this kind of spin noise be the cause of erasing the, the, the fast periodicities? The answer is no, because if you scale uh, capital T here down to an hour, uh, the spin noise is too small to account for the, the lack. Um, so we can scratch that one. Yeah, um, it's not that strongly dependent on the breaking index. I mean, it'll certainly change the numbers, but it won't take you from 10 to the five down to 0.1. For example, it might change things by an order of magnitude. Okay, uh, so uh, some, one aspect of free precession that I wanted to talk about briefly is uh, to compare geodetic and free precession. Uh, the key thing here is that with geodetic precession, that's the spin orbit GR effect, uh, the angle between the, the magnetic moment and the spin axis is constant over a precessional cycle. So in other words, the, tor the amount of torque does not change because it depends on that, the torque, the magnetic torque depends on that angle. Uh, but for free precession, that uh, dot product does change over the precessional cycle. So you get a cyclical torque. And for a hypermagnetar, that's a huge effect. Um, so this, I'll just quickly outline some of the numbers. So for a canonical pulsar, this might be of order of a microsecond if you had a 0.1 degree amount of precession. Um, and for that's for a particular spin down rate uh, of 10 to the minus 15 hertz per second. For the crab pulsar, you actually can allow no more than about one arc second of precession. So the precessional wobble is no more than an arc second in order to be consistent with the spin noise that we see. Uh, for magnetars, you plug in the numbers and you get you know, tens of seconds of of variation over the precession cycle. So this is kind of like, if you want to find the spin periodicity, you have to take out an orbit, if it's an orbiting pulsar. Um, here it would be the same thing. You have a long a precessional cycle, but you really don't know what the shape of that cycle is, because it depends on triaxiality or, or whatever, you know, a bunch of the precession parameters. So that accounts for not seeing periodicities in long time series of days, weeks, months but it still can't explain the one hour type data sets. For that you need, oh, and I, uh, before I go into that, um, we define something called the beam precession modulation function. Uh, all this means is that um, for those precessional windows in which you see bursts, there's actually structure within those windows in this precession model. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the amplitude of this modulation function over one precessional cycle and you typically get double uh, humps here in some cases triple so these two cases here are for axisymmetric stars for a triaxial star you get something that's even wilder and this is just a different presentation of those things the, the separation of these uh, of these components here uh, 
subcomponents of the window depend on various angles. Um, so one way of testing all this would uh, in the long term is when we have lots of bursts from uh, some of these poles or some of these FRBs that show long period periodicities is that we should start seeing structure within that burst window uh, that would be reflective of this kind of thing. Um, so it's a, it's a possible test. Okay, and then masking of the short uh, of the fast periodicities, you really have to rely on phase jitter. And that phase jitter can come about from, as I said, have said, altitude variations, maybe some kind of uh, refraction effect that's very that's stochastic within the magnetosphere, what have you. And so this is probed by the so called wait time distributions. Um, and I, given that I haven't gotten to the main uh, topic of my talk, uh, I want to make this brief. But the wait time distributions are just the sep distributions of the separations of detected bursts. And for these two FRB or two different FRBs here with uh, almost 2,000 bursts each, you see a, a one peak here in that distribution at 100 seconds. That's true for both of these. The other is at sort of a few to tens of milliseconds. Uh, those shorter uh, duration peaks uh, simply have to do with burst substructure. The main point here is that if there is a spin period involved, all you can say is that it's less than 100 seconds uh, from these wait time distributions. And we analyze how you can go from uh, having a fast periodicity here with, with zero, here's zero phase jitter, and as you ramp up on the phase jitter, when you get to about point three, you've pretty much erased the periodicity. Okay, so uh, the summer, I think I've already made the points in the summary. Now we want to move on to uh, a different topic, which is certain black media uh, for two galaxies as probed by this particular FRB and the M81 globular cluster. So we have this situation um, where the FRB is in the globular cluster the line of sight um, misses the disk of M81. So all we see in terms of um, the plasma is the, the CGM of M81. Um, possibly a small contribution from the globular cluster, but we're ignoring any such thing. Then you have three or so megaparsecs of IGM uh, that contributes pretty small, you know, almost negligible, neg negligibly to the dispersion measure. And then we have the Milky Way where the line of sight probes the CGM and the disk of the Milky Way. So we write the DM here for this case as the disk contribution from the NE2001 model plus two halos. And I'm just, it's a simplistic analysis, but we're assuming the two halos are the same. Uh, same thing for the scattering. So when I talk about this, that characteristic asymmetry, we talk about the scattering time tau. Same story, we get a contribution from the Milky Way's disk and then potentially from the two halos, but the, the bottom line is that the halos seem to contribute nothing uh, to the scattering. And so that translates then into some statements about turbulence within those CDNs. All right, so uh, uh, this is a big pile of numbers, but uh, there are really only a couple to pay attention to. The main point is that we have uh, taken the measured dispersion measure and the rotation measure from Faraday rotation, deconstructed them, and so you uh, obtain a CGM electron density, uh, a mean electron density of about 10 to the 4 per cc. Uh, that's averaged over a 200 kiloparsec radius CGM. And then the parallel component of the B field is, uh, is of order 0.5 microgauss. This can be compared with a, an analysis by Lan and Prochaska. They looked at a thousand galaxies with redshifts less than one, and they looked at potential RM variations, uh, extragalactic parts of the rotation measure contributed by galaxies. And they looked for a correlation between delta RM and the galaxy number density, didn't find anything. So they put an upper limit of two microgauss on that collection of CGMs. So not quite as strong as this particular one. Um, but anyway, the magnetic fields are small, um, but not that much smaller than the disk of the Milky Way, for example. Um, okay, but then what about turbulence in the CGM? So this is constrained by the very finest time structure. Uh, so the shots uh, that I was talking about. So there's uh, two papers, Majid et al. Uh, last year and Nimmo et al. in a paper that's in press. 
or actually I think it was just published. So I wanna divert a little bit to talk about scattering. Um, so uh, scatter, the kind of scattering we're talking about here is diffraction of density fluctuations. Uh, so if you have a characteristic scale L sub D, the D is for diffraction. Um, the diffraction angle is lambda over L sub D. Uh, for the Milky Way, you know, a milli arc second is of the right order. Uh, it scales like wavelength squared. Um, and that produces um, multipath, and that's manifested as scintillation. So you have time, this is intensity versus time and frequency. Uh, you can see that in this kind of rendition, or if you look at pulsar pulses, so this is now pulse phase, and then frequency, this banded structure here is the characteristic scintillation scale. And then the other manifestation is the pulse broadening that I've already talked about. Um, these are related by an uncertainty type relation where tau goes like one over t pi delta nu. Delta nu is the characteristic width of one of these so-called scintils. Tau scales very strongly with wavelength, lambda to the fourth power. Um, okay, so that's the basic picture. And then as far as the dispersion measure is concerned from the Milky Way disk, if you're looking at high latitudes, you have a cosecant law and um, it's basically 24 parsecs per cc looking straight up of the Milky Way. All right, so now um, we, uh, we're gonna calibrate the analysis using galactic pulsars. So we have the scattering time uh, versus dispersion measure uh, plot here. Um, and the, uh, all the points here in the, in, uh, represent measurements from pulsars and upper limits. And we have this sort of hockey stick or dog leg type diagram that represents that dis you know, the distribution. And our understanding of this, uh, which we've had in place for uh, maybe 30 years, is that <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the steeper part of this uh, hockey stick uh, is for lines of sight with large DNs necessarily are probing towards the inner galaxy. Um, you don't get high DMs otherwise. And uh, then the, at low DMs, you have this shallower dependence. So our, our, our understanding is that the steepening uh, is in part due to the fact that the mean electron density is bigger in the inner galaxy, but that cannot explain uh, what we see here. What you really need is a qualitative difference in the medium itself. So we've analyzed this in terms of uh, a cloudlet model where the scattering time is written as the square of the dispersion measure, um, and then times this parameter called F tilde. F tilde is related to the variance of the electron density and then involving, um, this is all in the context of a turbulence type model for the wave number spectrum of the density fluctuations. And so what's also involved besides variance is the outer scale and the inner scale. And I think I've left off a filling factor that should be in the denominator here. Uh, so, uh, so in order to get this distribution, um, F tilde has to be much larger in the inner galaxy than the outer galaxy. Um, so let me just give a quick indication of that. Um, here we have um, scattering times divided by dm squared versus galactic latitude. You can see the big peak at zero latitude here. This is a log scale, by the way. So we're talking about many orders of magnitude. And <clears throat> at high latitudes, we have sort of a mean uh, value. You can convert this to F tilde. And uh, so the mean here is about 10 to the minus 2.5. If you go to low latitudes, um, zero latitude, you get uh, values of F tilde that are five orders of magnitude bigger. So it's that's what I mean by the medium is quite different in the inner galaxy. In my mind, that's probably due to a higher supernova rate there. Okay, so um, now let's go to FRB. So we have the same hockey stick here, um, except that uh, the hockey stick now in cyan has been raised up by a factor of three because um, radio waves coming from extragalactic sources are look like plane waves when they're incident on the Milky Way. So they are actually scattered more by the Milky Way than a pulsar that uh, sees the same column density of scattering material. That pulsar emanates spherical waves, which are not scattered as much. So there's that factor of three. And then I'm also showing here the cloud of uh, chime FRBs uh, that um, you can see that they're shifted away from the hockey stick. And the easiest way to explain that is that 
some of the DM does not scatter, and that's totally consistent with the IGM not doing any scattering. Uh, so you can sort of mentally uh, subtract off IGM components in this cloudy shift, and you would have somewhat better agreement uh, with the hockey stick. Now that's not my approach or methodology for doing it. This is just a visual way of trying to uh, uh, portray what, what we do. Okay, so now for the single burst from, uh, from FRB 2020-0120E. Uh, this is showing um, a single burst with 30, uh, 31 nanosecond time resolution. And this is showing different zoom ins down here. So that's uh, 12 microseconds across there. And to make a long story short, uh, some of the structure that you see here looks like they are the shots uh, that I was talking about earlier. And the fact that we see those, and we see them in a way that statistically implies that they are not just noise fluctuations, that would not be the case if scattering was significant on these shots. These shots are originating from that FRB in the globular cluster. And what I'm saying is that there's no hint whatsoever of scattering uh, outside the Milky Way. So, uh, you know, there's some details about this, but I don't have time to go thorough into those details. You can look at the frequency structure here as well and discuss things, uh, but basically there's no evidence for extragalactic scattering. And the, a conservative upper limit is 65 nanoseconds is, is the upper limit on the combined scattering from the two CGMs. All right, uh, and then this is the slide, which I won't go into just corroborates what I just said, but goes into more of the details. Um, so I, I'm assuming my slides will be available to people so you can look at them offline. Or please come talk with me because I'll be here another three minutes. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, well, with the Cloudlet model, uh, tau is uh, the scattering time is uh, has this form about half a millisecond times a sub tau, that's a constant of order unity. Uh, G is a geometric factor that for this geometry is the unity also. So we have F tilde DM uh, in units of 100 DM units, well, 100 parsecs per cc squared. Um, and then frequency in gigahertz to the fourth power. And if we had a, a high redshift object, we'd have one plus Z cubed here. So the, the limit on uh, the 65 nanosecond limit means that F tilde is actually quite small, um, much smaller than what we see from Milky Way pulsars. But I think just backing up a little bit, um, this uh, our upper limit on tau is much less than what is um, estimated in a particular model uh, by Vedantham and Finney. Um, I actually think the model is quite good, but I think it may not apply to these two particular CGMs. So uh, just a quote from their paper um, uh, for, you know, they talk about these, uh, well, a CGM fog where the fog consists of parsec sized clouds, H1 clouds that have some degree of ionization, maybe quite a bit of ionization, and with a filling factor of 10 to the minus four or so uh, in these clouds. So anyway, the prediction then is that um, uh, uh, FRB sources, for example, would uh, would show 15 micro arc seconds of angular broadening and a millisecond uh, of temporal broadening at 30 centimeters. Well, that's quite a bit bigger than what we don't see. <laughs> um, so how do we reconcile this? Well, again, I think that there are ways of not producing this scattering because that scattering relies on having small scale fluctuations in those clouds, which need not occur. So here are some of the factors that influence that. <clears throat> so, um, uh, you know, if we have a power, a Kolmogorov type spectrum here, the, <clears throat> the larger scales, meaning those above the Fresnel scale, uh, simply refract the radiation, whereas one smaller than the Fresnel scale diffract. Um, and anyway, the Fresnel scale uh, is about a hundredth of an AU for the for galactic lines of sight, and it's about six AU for an intervening CGM. So there's a requirement to get multipath, which is what, what is meant when you have one of those asymmetric tails on a burst. Um, you have to have scales less than the Fresnel scale, but you also have to satisfy um, this requirement that the bending angles you get from those clouds 
have to exceed the angular size of the, of the cloudlets themselves as viewed by us. That's a comp that may not be obvious and it's a complicated way of saying it, but that requirement translates into this requirement. Um, and anyway, uh, so one way of, or probably the best way of shutting off scattering is by having a large inner scale that's comparable or bigger than the Fresnel scale. So what, uh, so the uh, inner scale uh, corresponds to the upper wave number cutoff here in the spectrum. So it's probably the cutoff of the, of the, of the uh, axis label as well, but that's wave number. Uh, and anyway, the inner scale in various media has been um, alternatively related to the thermal proton gyro radius, which goes like temperature to one half over magnetic field, or the proton plasma frequency, which goes like one over square root of the electron density. So you can have uh, in, in a CGM, these numbers might be, or this ratio may be quite good, and this uh, one over n sub e to square root uh, may also be quite good. So in fact, the inner scale might be approaching the the Fresnel scale, so you would not get scattering. Um, that's what that's a way of explaining what we uh, see uh, from these two CGMs. My uh, guess is that things are radically different as you go to higher redshift CGMs, where the star formation rate is higher. Probably the CGMs are more turbulent, and it could very well could be that FRBs will reveal that type of, of turbulence. Okay, so now, um, actually, okay, nine plus minutes since we started late. Uh, yeah. I'll make it fast. Okay, so this will uh, be a fast deconstruction. Uh, basically, uh, now looking at a uh, whopping 10 objects uh, to infer things about, um, well, estimating redshifts, but also um, estimating the fraction of the baryons that are in the ionized intergalactic medium. And it turns out that we, you know, even with this small data set, it's very suggestive that we can do this. Um, okay, so the, the basic idea is simple. Uh, we use scattering measurements to estimate the host galaxy dispersion measure. And then once we have that, we can take the overall inventory of dispersion measure. <clears throat> and uh, uh, once we have DMH here, we can move it to the left-hand side and we can then constrain DM, IGM, and then that gives us a, an estimate um, of the redshift. That's the basic idea. Uh, scattering is kind of, so scattering, uh, we will say is, we are saying is only coming about from the Milky Way and from the host galaxy. Uh, and then we use the cloudlet model once again. Okay, so quick ingredients. So we have, uh, uh, for our modeling of the IGM contribution to dispersion measure, uh, we have a log normal distribution, and it depends on FIGM, this fraction of, of baryons in the IGM, ionized IGM. And of course, uh, this distribution will depend on that. Uh, so uh, our application of this, uh, then um, we take the NE2001 estimate for the Milky Way disk contribution, and we include plus minus 20% uncertainty on that because we know that the ME2001 model, as much as I hate to admit, is not perfect. <laughs> um, and then we have a flat distribution in the Milky Way halo contribution. So here are the posterior PDFs for at least four, of the, four out of the nine, uh, the first nine uh, FRBs. Um, if you have a, a large value of FIGM, then you need less host galaxy DM. And so the red curves are shifted to lower DMs here. That's this is a dispersion measure along the, uh, the x-axis here. Um, in those units, and I'll also say that for FRB 12.1102, the Balmer lines um, allow us to estimate the emission measure, and from that, the dispersion measure, in a, albeit in a model-dependent way, but what we get is a plausible range for dispersion measure using that method is consistent with this DM inventory method. So it's, you know, I think it hangs together in that sense. Now, um, okay, so anyway, we use the cloudlet model and we use a flat prior for F tilde. That's what that slide says. Uh, we can investigate now what um, DMH, the host galaxy DM is and what the scattering time is as a function of host galaxy redshift. If we treat that redshift as a free parameter or independent variable, 
if everything is at zero redshift, then there's no IGM contribution and all the extragalactic GM is, is uh, in the host galaxy. But as you, as you go to higher redshift, uh, the DMH plummets and you have a range of possible redshifts um, that uh, are basically the cosmic variants of the IGM contribution. All right. Um, so anyway, we can then uh, put this all together and derive posterior PDFs for the redshifts. Uh, estimating redshifts using three different estimators. One is DM only. That's this uh, greenish curve here. And then the two black curves has to do uh, with incorporating scattering as well. And if you scan through this, you can see, in, like in this case, they all agree. That's because the scattering is actually quite small and so not constraining. But then there's a case like this um, where the, uh, and I should say that the vertical red dashed line is, represents the true redshift. Uh, that's much more consistent with the scattering uh, approach rather than uh, the green curve here, which is the GM only approach. So we could stare at these, but let's look at it more statistically. Um, here now is uh, estimated redshift versus true redshift for the sample we have, nine objects. And this is for an FIGM of 0.4. This is for an FIGM of 0.85. You can see that for 0.4, there's, uh, the estimates are biased way too high and a lot of scatter. There's 0.85, which is a number that is commonly found in the literature. Uh, it's much better behaved, um, less variance, and essentially no bias. You can also see that in these curves, which shows the mean residual uh, redshift. Um, what you want is these curves to be at zero. So that's the no bias place. And uh, the curves for the different estimators uh, cross uh, this line in different places. But for the two scattering approaches, they cross in this sort of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, range for FIGM. And then in terms of the RMS residual, uh, there's a, a shallow minimum here that's also in the same range. So anyway, I think that um, is a proof of principle at this stage um, based on nine objects. And now let's look at, let's look quickly <laughs> at uh, this uh, interesting object, uh, FRB 2019-0520B. Uh, this is a, 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 a very high DM object. Um, if you take the dispersion measure only uh, approach, it would, you would get a redshift that exceeds unity, uh, but the actual redshift is 0.241. And so we estimate that the DMH uh, for that host galaxy is about 900. Um, okay, and then here are similar plots to what I've shown for the other cases. Uh, here's the posterior PDF for GM. Here's the posterior PDF for uh, redshift estimate. And uh, the, the scattering base estimator is pretty much bang on for our assumed prior of F tilde. And then here where you look at Z hat versus Z, uh, the blue points here represent the DM only uh, estimator and the other colors, uh, orange and green represent scattering based uh, estimators. And you can see that with dispersion only are way off. Um, that's not a surprise given other things I've shown you, but anyway, then uh, the, the scattering base estimators, uh, again, are much closer to the curve. So the approach that we took for the first nine objects was totally independent of this object. And I wanted to show the, you know, our, our game plan was to show that first because those nine alone demonstrate that there's some power in using scattering. Uh, but this object, uh, which is extreme, fits into that picture perfectly. All right, so uh, I won't have a chance to go into this, uh, explain this because it's uh, fairly dense here. But the point of this slide is that we can also localize the scattering in that host galaxy to within 100 parsecs of the source. Uh, that's using this uh, basically a coherence length argument that I'm happy to talk with people about. And lastly, uh, you can put this all together and just say, okay, how much does scattering in the universe influence how, uh, how much of a selection effect is that produced in burst surveys? And the answer is it can be significant. Um, so there's a paper by Stella Ocker uh, and Shami Chatterjee and myself uh, where we've put this together uh, and looked at uh, contributions to pulse broadening from the Milky Way, from nearby galaxies, uh, and then uh, going out to high redshifts. And this is a factor, but I will also say that this is all based on having 
CGMs that really don't scatter very much. They scatter a little. And my, my sense is that at higher redshifts, the turbulence in CGMs may be much higher. And that would have a much bigger effect on being able to see FRBs at high redshifts at least at say one gigahertz type frequencies or below, uh, but you could go to higher frequencies. All right, so uh, the last slide then is just my main points and I'll just leave these up here uh, and finish with that. Questions, we'll take questions from the audience and then Jim will be monitoring the, the Zoom. Yeah, so for those of you online, please, Type your questions into the chat because we lost our speaker. <laughs> Where did I go? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay, questions. So at this point, now, I basically you search for things that may be in search. Okay, so you mean finding, so for finding periodicities. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. A quadratic, you know, you can put in a phase function of anything you like, you can put in a full orbit yeah. or uh, just a parabola to account for acceleration where you can put in jerk. Yeah. yeah, so that has been looked at. Um, so what I, one thing we are trying right now is to take more of an agnostic phase function um, and just, you know, use a polynomial with maybe up, up to order four or five, and then uh, just search the heck out of that parameter space and try to find the magic combination. Yeah. So, again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, I at one point had a slide in, in here that uh, showed different kinds of beaming. Uh, the beaming is constrained by the beauty cycle of those windows. Uh, the, you know, the window separating the, six, you know, the 16 day period of 160 day. So the do, I mentioned the beauty cycle is 30, 40% for one of them, it's more like 60% for the other. If you have too wide of a beam or, or maybe a multiple beams that cover too wide of an overall solid angle, you would have bursts occurring outside those windows. So that's the answer. So, it, so the beam is constrained by, by that. And your exome is the physical model that is the value. Yeah, you don't really need to simulate it if I understand what kind of, well, I'm not quite sure what kind of simulation you mean, but you don't have to simulate it because the whole point of F tilde is that it allows you to relate a certain level of turbulence along a given line of sight. Um, you know, the, the electron density fluctuations are in the same electrons that produce the beam, right? So they're tied together. And then um, if you put together this pilot model, as a, as a means for modeling both beam and the scatter, then F tilde naturally comes out. It's a bulk parameter that captures the fluctuation within pilots, it captures the fluctuation in clouds within some medium where the clouds have a chilling factor. And then the turbulent section within a cloud has an inner ceiling that is there. So it's, it's about as simple as you can get. And um, so you don't really need to simulate that in the sense that you don't have to model cloud work necessarily. What you can simulate is say a galaxy that has different values of that solar in this region. In fact, that's what the end of 2001 model. We have different F values of you know, spiral lines, spin and thickness, pumps. And uh, the way I think the bottom line is that that model reproduces the happy state. So it's not quite what you're suggesting, but it's kind of the reverse of that. 
There's a question from the Zoom. Audience. Yeah, we have a couple questions from online. The first is, will the mechanism introducing large timing noise and spin period also influence the precession period? Um, yeah, uh, let's see, um, for a magnet, yeah. So I would make the distinction between spin noise, you know, when it comes down to it, I distinguish between spin noise in a regular pulsar and in a magnetar, especially a hyper magnetar. So the spin noise, if it is related to the reconfiguration of the magnetic field, then the answer is yes, because that reconfiguration is going to change the figure of the star. So yeah, it'll make the precession stochastic as well. Uh, that's We did not analyze that, but we certainly talked about that notion. We didn't want to go that far. Okay, next question is from Kunal. He wants to know about free precession. Free precession. Are there any galactic analogies, and does it require magnetar-like magnetic fields? Um, I would say we don't know of any any examples in the pulsar world for preset where you have to have precession. You have to have some mechanism for producing the spin noise. Uh, it could involve some precession, but um, is when you have pinned vortices, that just changes the picture entirely. So I would say the answer is no, we don't have any examples. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more. The last question is from Sterl. He says he's a bit confused why you compared your, their prediction for a fraction for metal ion absorptions in the intervening systems at Z equals one to diffractive scintillation in M81. In M81, the half halo at Z equals zero, there's only 5% chance of the line of sight going through a metal line cloud. And even if it did, the lever arm for M81 is tiny compared to that from a cloud in an intervening system at Z equals a half. So the time scale is vastly reduced even if the line of sight went through a metal line cloud and there were turbulence in it. Kind of a long one. Yeah. Um, yeah, let, we should discuss this offline, Cyril. Um, but uh, I wanted to compare it with some model. So uh, yours was a handy one to compare it to. Um, yeah, so I mean, the probability of intersecting something. Uh, and I think my point is not inconsistent with yours, which is that I think those halos are different. And you bring up the geometric effect of if you have an intervening, you know, let's say a, a, a halo that's halfway between us and an FRB, you get a huge geometric boost. Uh, which we did, well, we did include the fact that there's not a geometric boost for those two halos. So yeah, may, if your numbers incorporated that boost, then yeah, uh, then you would predict uh, for the geometry of M81, you'd predict a much smaller value. I agree with that. Yeah, I think we should go at this point. Did you use that Vix? Yes, we have wine on the back patio for the first time this year. Yeah, so. it's different every time. The <laughs> speaker just totally went to foot. Huh. But, yeah. 